Hello, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. My guests today are Robert Collar, CEO, and Jochen Metzger, Global Head of Markets at Now CM, the new market infrastructure for the primary debt capital markets that provides a cloud-based solution to the legendary inefficiencies of the bond origination, negotiation, and issuance process, and also owns and operates a regulated multilateral trading facility, or MTF, for the primary debt markets. Robert, uh, Jochen, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Dominic, and the future of finance. One of the things I looked at uh, in preparing for our conversation today was the, was the history. Uh, and I know that now CM emerged from the purchase by EPPF of the MTF uh, sister company to the ID2S uh, blockchain-based CSD for the commercial paper markets in in Paris. Can you tell us, Robert, what was the opportunity that EPPF identified? Uh, this goes back a few years already. So we are actually a market initiative uh, based uh, on the uh, instance of a few German banks that wanted to harmonize uh, the European market. So that was actually pre-CMU. Um, and I was working as a lawyer at the time, and we wanted to create a, a, a more efficient marketplace. And uh, when I started looking into this uh, as a DCM lawyer, uh, we found together with the banks that it's not just the documentation that needs uh, updating. Uh, it needs also the entire process was completely out of date. Uh, as I always say, the, the biggest changes in the last 50 years uh, was the introduction of email and Microsoft Word. Um, and that's it. In, in many documents, you still find fax numbers and, and they're still being used. Um, so we looked into this and the initiative got really quickly into an international initiative involved regulators and, and, and international banks and uh, really wanted to create uh, something that lowers the entry barriers to capital markets uh, makes it more efficient, creates a golden source of, of data and um, increases the certainty of execution so that uh, funding becomes as easy as making a transfer on your mobile app uh, uh, to to um, to another participant uh, where Jochen has actually uh, mastered uh, a lot of, of uh, things that we're using today in his time at the Bundesbank. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, and I think we're in a, in a good way there already, achieve similar uh, successes in the primary markets. The story you tell is certainly familiar to me. Uh, uh, back in the 1980s, I had a brief and undistinguished career in the Eurobond markets. And I can remember the excitement uh, when we switched from the telex machine to the fax machine. Uh, and I was horrified when I first began to look at this area uh, in the last couple of years to find that faxes were still being used, as, you, as you've just <laughs> described. Anyway, um, clearly you identified an opportunity, but you've taken in some other investors uh, since then. Who are they? Where did they come from? Why did they become shareholders? What was the opportunity that they saw? Well, it's uh, I think the opportunity that they saw is a, what investors call a deep blue ocean. It's It's something that hasn't been done um, and um, where uh, there's a huge opportunity to, to change uh, in, in a good way, uh, one of the biggest markets in the world, uh, although it's very niche uh, and very few investors understand actually uh, what is going on um, and the processes. It took us many years to, to really figure out the entire value chain and what uh, everybody's doing and, and how many parties are involved. Uh, so most of them are uh, private individuals, high net worth individuals, uh, management, of course, and we have two VCs uh, in, in our uh, share capital um, that have uh, funded us for the past few years. And also the acquisitions that you mentioned uh, also passed. Um, uh, we've also acquired the assets of Nivura, which was a former uh, competitor. And um, yeah, we, we we're very grateful for their support and, and are looking forward to uh, welcoming uh, new investors in, in the near future. Uh, Jochen, perhaps I could bring you in at this point. We've talked as if it's obvious what the uh, shortcomings in the debt capital markets from a primary issuance point of view are. 
but how would you describe the problems which now CM is looking to solve in the debt capital markets? What are they? What are those problems? Uh, Dominic, uh, we first uh, want to overcome the fragmentation of uh, the debt markets by national law, regulation, and custom, including business rules. And uh, by doing so, we could create a virtual, a virtual cycle of funding where more issuers attract more dealers and more investors, pulling in even more issuers, and this goes on and on. And uh, in doing so, this would create a really deep and liquid primary debt market. And of course, this will add a lot of strength to the European Capital Markets Union. Could I ask you to clarify that first point you made, Jochen, about overcoming the fragmentation? After all, that is what the whole CMU, the whole Capital Markets Union is, is really about. How, how can an organization like yours accomplish that? Does it not require sweeping changes in uh, in regulation, in securities law, tax laws, and so on? I think it's not about changing the, le the regulation. What we try to achieve is how you can live with, let's say, diverging regulation, i.e. we want to provide you with the tools to overcome or to deal with that, let's say, fragmentation. And this is, let's say, quite successful if you think of the golden source data model. The data model goes a long way because it will allow you to produce the documents according to different national laws or regulations at, let's say, the tip of a button. Yeah, That's uh, what we try to do. Okay, I see. You, you're adapting to, to the fragmentation, yep. dealing with it more efficiently. Now, we're not talking here about a startup either. Now CM is actually operating. You've supported issues. The, the figure I saw was, was 10 billion euros. So th this is not trivial. Can you tell us a bit about what types of issuers, by which I mean, are they banks or insurance companies or corporates, uh, and the types of issues? Uh, are you doing just bonds? Or are you doing short term, maybe commercial paper, money market instruments as well? Um, so tell us a bit about the type of issuers, the type of issues, and what sort of services uh, they're purchasing from you at this point, and indeed how you expect those services and clients to evolve in the future. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Um, I think there's two things we need to clarify first before going into this. One is that now CM sees itself as a vertically integrated uh, company. So we have three legs and we'll discuss this probably a bit later on uh, in, in more detail. But one is where we act as issue for other people. Uh, the other one is where we automate uh, the issuance process. And the third one is the marketplace. Um, so we are actually an issuer, a market participant, a market maker, uh, and an infrastructure provider in terms of, of uh, um, digitalization of, of process. Uh, the other thing which which needs to be clarified and uh, is when we talk about transactions there's a lot of confusion in the market so for us a transaction is not just doing the documentation uh, you'll see out there uh, people that say they've done billions and billions of transactions but in reality they have just prepared a term sheet or, or something similar um, so this is what we call now docs and where we have the, the automation and our uh, unparalleled data model. Uh, we, we don't count these as transactions because it, it becomes absurd in terms of numbers and uh, really what we're doing is we're facilitating the process. We're not a party in this. But where we are a party is in the other two legs uh, is uh, what we call now Treasury, where we have a regulated entity in Luxembourg, where we actually act as issuer, deal with all uh, the administrative stuff, take away a lot of hassle, uh, from uh, companies, municipalities, SSAs that want to go to market, uh, but haven't done so because of the high entry barriers. And we've developed with big law firms like Clifford Chance, White and Case, Simmons and Simmons, and uh, in, in France, we work with CMS Lefebvre, uh, a standard documentation which we provide to our issuers, and they then can use this. It's fully automated, and uh, the costs are down about 80, 90%, and, and the speed is uh, for the setup down from months to weeks. 
uh, and once set up, it's it's real time. So there we've done uh, several hundreds of millions and have a pipeline of several billions uh, for this uh, next year, um, where we, for example, did the London Borough of Sutton. Uh, we we're working also for, uh, with a German corporate like Haniel uh, and have many more uh, coming. Um, also, project finance is is a big uh, thing there. So this this is where we actually consider transactions being done and and which which counts uh, as opposed to just providing the documentation. And uh, to the marketplace, Jochen can tell much, uh, more. Yeah. Let me expand here a little bit about the NAUCM France MTF. Currently, we are having forty three members, of which thirty are issuers. We have seven dealer banks and 16 investors. And uh, to date, they have done some 500 transactions uh, with a little less than 15 billion euros in CP outstanding. And uh, that's, let's say, the uh, now CM France marketplace. Now, the, the MTF, which I, which I mentioned in my opening remarks is now branded as as now markets alongside now docs and and now treasury who's who's using it how does it work yeah dominic today it's uh let's say french issuers french dealer banks and french investors using new cp and this is the template that was uh, developed by the banque de france to support the money market and of course we want to make it European. We want to bring new issues, say, for example, from Germany. We want to bring new instruments. We call this now bonds. This would include Euro commercial paper. It would include Euro MTN and uh, it would include all bonds. And we want to have, let's say, now CM France as a primary market for all debt instruments for issuers, big and small, for corporates, banks. And we want to cover the full geographic and risk spectrum of the EU. That's the ambition. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that now markets is a is a primary market only. What explains that focus? Why not get involved in the secondary market as well? Um, maybe I can say a few words here. I think one really needs to let it sink in what we're doing here. It's it's really the first regulated market globally in the primary uh, bond issuance area, uh, commercial paper also being bonds, uh, legally speaking. And um, that is something that has never been done before. You negotiate on a platform, um, the, you, you agree the terms, you push a button and everything else goes automatically. Um, so th this is where we see the, the deep blue ocean, where we see uh, the chance to really um, increase uh, and change the funding um, behavior that is currently done. Instead of going to the market and, and, and fund the 4 billion uh, benchmark because you need it for an acquisition or so, uh, you could also go to the market several times a day. Um, so you have much more pricing points, more liquidity, uh, and and the marginal costs due to our automation and data model have become so low that that we can actually offer this uh, service. Uh, so th th this is really what I think this th is the the revolutionary uh, part uh, of it. And, and Jochen, maybe you can. Yeah, yeah, I would like uh, yeah, to add here. Of course, this revolution. Uh, let's say, kind of uh, is uh, getting closer to the secondary market. The line between primary markets and secondary markets starts to blur when you consider the near real-time funding. But uh, our competitive advantage, our strength at NAUCM is uh, tied to the easy issuance process. And it peters out, say, the farther you get out in the secondary market, we cannot really compete with the huge reach of, say, TradeWeb, Bloomberg, or ICAP. But let's say we can go, let's say, the first steps towards uh, this direction that we can do. Mm -hmm. As you say, Jochen, it, you can't completely divorce the primary and the secondary markets. Uh, on the other hand, it's quite a crowded field. 
with uh, trading platforms, secondary markets in place already. But in your long term thinking, are there any plans to develop a, a secondary market or is it just too soon to be thinking about things like that? Uh, Dominic, let me repeat uh, the competitive advantage of NAUCM is uh, related to the primary end. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the secondary debt market space, we cannot do much. However, what we can do, we can provide more data to the secondary market. If you are a now docs client, you can really come up with, let's say, real time credit information. And this may support, let's say, the secondary market trading. Think of algo trading. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not yet possible, but that's something we would be happy to, let's say, assist and support. So not ourselves going to the secondary market, but making the secondary market space a better place too. That's what we could do. Robert, you've you've mentioned a number of times that this service you offer isn't just about documentation, but the core service of of now cm is this sharing of data but also that documentation facility what you call now docs can you explain in a bit more detail you've alluded to it more than once can you explain a bit more detail how it how it's how it works and how customers are using it i'm talking here of now docs yes so i, I wouldn't call it a core service i would say it's the first uh, service in a row of services so in order to digitalize the whole market uh, and make it real time, we need to get people on a digital platform. And this is what we provide with NowDocs. Um, whereas at the moment, you have 30, 40 parties sending emails, PDFs, faxes, and uh, telex I haven't seen lately, but uh, it's not too long ago uh, around. And uh, even handwritten markups with, with uh, uh, scanned copies and so on, uh, in, it's via unsecured channel like email. Uh, we've all consolidated this in one cloud-based platform, increased security. Uh, we worked there together with a company called Resecure to, to really offer bank-grade uh, security. And uh, where all the people uh, that uh, have uh, a role to play in this process, and as I said, these are sometimes up to 30, 40 parties, uh, can access the data, can enrich it, uh, can consume it, uh, so I would call ourselves really a, a data company in the end. And all of this is based on a data model that we've been developing over the past 11 years. Uh, so I, I started the first proof of concept 11 years ago with a German bank. Uh, and since then, we've developed our data model more and more. Um, and it, it is a very comprehensive one because we what we can do is we can represent the entire information that is not only in the prospectus, not only referring to the issue, to the risk factors, or to the T's and C's, and with this, the entire life cycle of a bond, we also have all the side documents like subscription agreements, agency agreement, all of this is machine readable. And suddenly you have uh, a data set that covers um, all the data that is in spread over all these documents and at the moment unaccessible in unstructured PDFs and you have it in a in a very structured uh, data model with more than 5,000 variables and, and 15,000 plus business rules that link these variables together. So uh, th this is uh, where um, everybody benefits because uh, at the moment you have uh, inside the banks and outside the banks a lot of people typing in this information manually into a myriad of different systems. And with our API-based um, uh, system, which is centralized and, and cloud-based, uh, we can provide a, a real uh, source of truth or golden data uh, source in, to, to all participants. And that makes a huge difference in terms of error correction, in terms of execution. Of course, real time becomes uh, possible with this. Um, and you have all in one data set. You say everybody benefits, Robert. I wonder if you're popular with your former colleagues in the law. Well, actually, yes, they're onboarding us as well. Um, <clears throat> so there's several reasons for that first of all no one in their right mind thinks we're going back to manual digitalization is happening um otherwise uh, yeah i think people would 
challenge your state of mind if if you change if you argue the other way other way um they are very intelligent people so they know this perfectly well uh law firms have also difficulties to finding uh new recruits uh, to do low value repetitive work um so they're also looking for automation solutions and um by being more uh, efficient internally, they can, for example, reduce the prices a little bit, uh, but still be more profitable than they were before because uh, the whole process is more efficient. So it's it's really win-win for everyone here. Yeah. But one, one thing to add is there is if we would focus only on automation uh, without the other two legs, marketplace and, um, and issuer, uh, in the end, it will become a... a it, it it would become let's say uh, a fight for fees uh, along the value chain that that's for sure and and that's i think where other business models for very short uh, what we want to do is to grow the pie uh, really in in a uh, in favor of everyone in the market so by giving access to uh, to people who haven't done it yet or entities and, and there's the famous comparison that, that you certainly know about American capital markets, which are 80% uh, financing uh, the economy, whereas in, in Europe, it's 80% bank financed or 70%. Uh, um, so it's it's really the opposite. And there's a huge growth potential for, for capital markets. Okay, so it's about increasing the revenue, lowering the costs and therefore widening everyone's margins, I guess. Now, it, Jochen, can you tell me about Now Services? I've put it in my mind somewhere as a toolbox, which users can sort of pick and mix which services they want to use for their particular needs. Now, why does a, if I've understood it correctly, why does a pick and mix option make sense for, for Now CM? Now, Dominic, uh, Now CM is, yes, a toolbox, but it's also more, it's also an open platform. The issuers and all other actors involved in pre-trade and post-trade, they can use it, however, without being locked in. They can connect to NowCM, they can connect, let's say, our tools, our toolbox to their internal systems, and they can also bring in other resources as needed. The toolbox is fast and highly flexible, and the open setup, the open platform ensures that now CM will work under all market conditions. Need new players, bring them on. Now, um, now CM is about access, process, and price discovery. We call this APP, and uh, it's the toolbox plus the open platform that makes it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I guess the openness then is about attracting people, generating those network effects, which will lead to yes. That revenue, yes. which Robert was describing. Yeah. Um, talking of, of automation and, and growing the marketplace, book building is how we all tend to think of the, the bond markets um, going back at least a century and a half. Uh, you've got now books. This is clearly intended to improve that process. How does it improve it? Why is it better than the traditional book building method, which took place largely over the telephone, I imagine? Uh, well, current book building is 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 done by incumbents uh, already via the internet, but but very let's say aged platforms. Uh, now books is a project is is not live yet. Um, so first we we want to bring bonds to to now markets, uh, which is our main main focus. Uh, but it it is another tool that people then can use uh, and which is fully integrated. At the moment, the book building. Uh, you're right, uh, investors are being checked upon uh, by sales uh, by phone, and then they submit their orders and either the bank or they directly type it into the book building system. Uh, but to set up the bond, you already need to do some manual work. And um, with with a data model like ours, uh, it, it becomes much more uh, efficient and uh, it becomes much easier to to, to uh, create the book to use the data for the issuers that they want to uh, analyze and uh, because we're regulated we're also swift member uh, so we can also automatically uh, send and this this again is a future vision it's it's in development uh, we, we could send uh, all the settlement and payment instructions directly out of the book building system you 
you mentioned a while back now treasury uh which if i understand it correctly is a kind of issuance service correct uh, and does it derive from the eppf model of I, li I like this phrase actually capital markets as a as a service uh anyway how does now treasury work for the for the users Indeed. So now, now Treasury or EPPF, as we were called before, uh, which stands uh, or stood for European Primary Placement Facility, um, we changed the name because we found out there is a, actually a terrorist organization with the same uh, abbreviation. So we thought it was not the, the best name to continue with and took the takeover of NowCP as a as a chance to become now capital markets. Uh, but basically we, we have a regulated entity in, in Luxembourg uh, that uh, is an uh, issuance vehicle that can be divided into compartments which are completely ring-fenced uh, self-sustained pockets, um, really similar to a finance subsidiary in the Netherlands or even in Luxembourg, but without all the costs. So uh, having a compartment gives you basically a company, but you don't have to uh, wear all the costs. It's, it's audited by PwC. Uh, we have professional directors um, and it's regulated. So uh, it, it allows for um, real pass through or, or treasury management as well. You can uh, use it for more than, than just issuance, of course, um, but it reduces the cost and it provides a lot of benefit us being legally the issuer. You would still uh, if you look up London Borough of Sutton, you will find London Borough of Sutton in Bloomberg, uh, but it would say uh, Sutton via uh, now CM. Um, what that means is that the underlying borrower uh, really doesn't have to deal with all these complex issues uh, touching CSDs uh, and listings and, and other things which we have all automated and, and connected to. Uh, the issue really gets on or the underlying borrower only gets a loan from our vehicle in Luxembourg uh, and has the same experiences they would go to uh, to a bank. Um, the loan is 100% pass through, so there's no deductions or, or anything, no withholding. Um, the only thing the underlying borrower has to do is to guarantee the bond so that we're speaking about uh, the same credit. It's obviously not the credit of, of the SPV. Um, and when I say just to guarantee, uh, this requires a very sophisticated framework, which we've been developing for more than two years with auditors, regulators, and mostly rating agencies so that there is no um, deduction in terms of, of pass-through. Um, and uh, then uh, participate in the roadshow and explaining uh, their credit story. Uh, but everything else is done by us, and that's why we coined the term capital markets as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Dominic, uh, let me add here this combination of the marketplace with the, the now treasury that uh, allows or brings in borrowers that would have shied away from the market for the hassle. This is, let's say, broadening the investment universe. This is also attracting the dealers and the investors. And uh, let me make again reference to this virtuous cycle of the capital markets. New borrowers bring, let's say, new dealers and new investors. And this attracts again borrowers. So this makes, let's say, the marketplace a lot richer. The execution brings certainty and speed. And let's say for investors, they can get better, the well-defined, well-diversified and richer investment portfolios. So the combination makes it uh, more valuable. Mm -hmm. Now, from a from a user's point of view, you've got, we've got now markets, we've got now treasury, we've got now docs, we've got now services, we've got now books as, as well. If I'm a customer coming to use some combination of these services, do I experience these as silos or do they interoperate seamlessly from my point of view as a customer? Um, we're just rolling out a new user interface where um, all of the services will be seamlessly integrated. We have already integrated now docs and now space. Next step is now markets. And what we're building is basically a an operating system uh, where we can add additional services uh, based on a on a shared uh, standard, which 
in the end, again, goes back to this comprehensive data model, uh, which is really the most important part uh, of it. Um, and where we also can add third party options, like, for example, uh, I think we'll, we'll talk about this later, but uh, Bond Auction is, is, uh, is a partner of ours and additional services can build upon this. So you, you can think about it like a, um, like in the mobile phone, uh, the, the operating system, which gives you a, a calendar and the, uh, and the calculator, and you can do the, uh, the basic functions. But if you want to have something highly special specialized, uh, then you can uh, add additional apps and, and, and tools. Uh, and uh, Dominic, let, let me add here, we are not a silo. We are an open platform. The openness is a part of the DNA. You can invite your service providers to, let's say, join NowCM, the platform. You can do also things outside NowCM. But let's say this is it. If you want to be, let's say, the new data standard, the new model, you have to be open. So we are an open silo if you want. But this is, of course, a contradiction. No, we are open. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Robert, you you used the word uh, comprehensive a minute ago, uh, and it, it it sounds to me like you're covering the full gamut uh, of the primary debt capital markets here. But are you have you got any other additional services planned or in mind for the for the near future? Uh, well, we we we're onboarding lots of additional applications, as I said. So. Uh, I wouldn't call it an app store yet, but it might become something like that in the future. Um, we also have additional services that work in the background, like for example, now access, uh, which is a very sophisticated user management and access control system, uh, where we connecting now to several issuers, banks, uh, and, and manage uh, their, um, the users uh, there as well. So this, um, there, there's a lot of, um, yeah, things going on uh, where we hope because we're such an open platform um, as opposed to other island solutions uh, where we, we we will add additional functionality. So there's, um, we're connected to several stock exchanges, for example, which um, you can just click a button and say send to exchange XYZ uh, and this triggers a listing process. Um, uh, or uh, we can send to SWIFT uh, payments instructions and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the ecosystem is growing really day by day. But uh, the marketplace, Dominic, is also a very important component of that ecosystem in a way that it provides, let's say, a fair execution on a regulated MTF platform. And of course, uh, let's say pricing is being monitored for its uh, competitiveness. So it's the combination of, let's say, an open ecosystem with a regulated marketplace that gives extra value. Yeah. Okay. And it's a regulatory requirement to demonstrate those yep. fair prices. Yeah, sorry to jump in here. You, you, you're raising a really good point, and we've seen this in the crypto space. Um, as I said, we're the only regulated market in the world. There's, there's other uh, around that call themselves marketplaces. Um, as we've seen with Binance and FTX and so on, uh, it, it's uh, really dangerous to, to to participate in those because you, you can become a, um, a contributor to an unregulated marketplace. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, we we take a lot of pride and effort in to, to be regulated. It, it's a, a huge cost and, uh, and, and also effort, but we want to be institutional grade and not just some yeah, geeks that set up a marketplace uh, which is unregulated where you have no control. We don't know whether the parties are KYC, the, uh, have AML checks and, and so on. So you, you really get into, uh, into, into very dangerous territory, especially if you're thinking the counterparties that we're actually working with, which are the largest SSAs in the world, the largest banks, um, they, they have, uh, yeah, very high uh, demands on, on compliance. And, and this is what we are providing with, with this fully regulated environment. You both use that, that term openness, but can we be a bit more specific now about exactly how you're going about 
recruiting issuers. You've mentioned, for example, the London Borough of Sutton a number of times. I, I don't know what the story is, how they came to you, but it sounds from what you're saying that, that their advisors invited them to take part or they invited their advisors to take part. So any issuer can 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 say, well, we're working with this investment bank, this law firm, and we'd like to issue these securities onto this stock exchange. And, uh, and you can accommodate that. So Correct, my, yeah. my narrow question is, how are you going about finding and getting issuers to use your services? Well, <clears throat> there's several, several ways. I mean, uh, we, we, we speak to the large issuers uh, directly. Uh, there's uh, I would, what I would call key opinion leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are um, EIB, paving, paving the way. Yeah, for example, that is, these are the, the, the names. Um, and there's uh, also inside the banks, uh, I mean, we've gone through several selection processes mm -hmm. where uh, these key opinion leaders have checked out the market, have compared us uh, to uh, any other uh, available services. And uh, with, with some pride, I can say that we have 100% of any competitive uh, processes. And uh, I, I think this the work that these key opinion leaders are doing is is extremely valuable for the market because they spend a lot of time and money some onboarding processes take two years um and have 40 50 people involved from different offices time zones and and so on so it's it's uh, it's a lot of work for us of course as well uh, but it's a real service for the market because not everybody has the resources that these big institution have to uh, really check all the services and then say, well, this is the one I want to work with, um, and and this is the best in the in the market, and we're going to onboard them. And this process takes them uh, two two years um, because of all the complexities and 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 uh, different areas that it touches. So um, I, apart from that, we work of course with partners, uh, with law firms, with software providers, with uh, banks of of course uh, most importantly um so we're also planning some direct campaigns uh with with issuers um there's there's uh, several ways of of doing this but i think the the confidence comes from the key opinion leaders having taken these decisions uh and having spent the time and money to really check out the market and 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 say this this is the platform i want to work with because one thing we notice also is that neither investors no issues which in the end are the two principles in this value chain uh they don't want to connect to 20 different platforms uh they want one platform where they can do uh, everything uh because as you can imagine connecting uh nowadays uh, to to anything uh, is a huge compliance uh, and IT effort. So, uh, yeah, th these these things uh, tend to be kept at the minimum, and and therefore this this pre selection I think is is really important. I don't know, Jochen, if you want to add something. Uh, maybe let me emphasize again uh, the charming feature of a regulated <clears throat> MTF where an issuer can expose his curve to, let's say, a variety of uh, dealers and investors, uh, let's say, in a fair and regulated and monitored environment. Some uh, some issues, issuers prefer it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert, you mentioned that investors and issuers don't want to invest a lot of time and money in connecting to 20 platforms. Uh, how hard is it to connect to, to now? Is it, is it a very simple process or...? Do they have to... uh, technically it's it's straightforward uh where the complexity comes in is with the rules and regulations uh so we we have uh banking outsourcing rules which are already very strict in germany they're even stricter than elsewhere thanks to wirecard um and we have the dora uh, rules coming into place um so there's uh, for example Brexit also made it more complex. If, if you're a UK service provider under DORA, you will have mm -hmm. a, a substantial presence in the EU uh, where uh, you will also have need to give access to the regulators uh, and so on. We've, we've already been through this exercise with several banks 
um, and and issuers that are regulated. Um, so we 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 can uh, tell the story. We even the agreements they have to be had to be made completely new from scratch because no one had anything like this. And funding being a, a critical function um, in for for many issuers uh is is a critical outsourcing then so uh, this is really where the complexity comes comes in and mm -hmm. where you need to prepare reports you need to have an iso certification uh you need to be regulated you need to have a regulatory capital uh so i, I read a very funny email newsletter recently from uh, from one of our competitors that after silicon valley bank went bankrupt and they said oh we had a really bad weekend uh, because we didn't know if, whether our uh, funds were lost or not. So uh, this happens if you work with a non-regulated entity, because as a regulated entity, we need to have a capital buffer. Um, so th these are all these things that get checked and checked and checked again uh, from the myriads of departments um, in, um, in, in the banks, because in the end, yeah. Uh, if you if you mess up a comma or uh, if you're not able to do it in German and English, but you have a German issuer who wants to make his contract under German law, then uh, yeah, uh, it's it's very hard to provide the service. So this this is really why this data model again comes into play that uh, it needs to cover all of all of these possibilities. Yeah. So technically, an interface is quite straightforward. Yep. To have a compliant interface is a bit more complex. Yep. You're gathering enough experience to help people get over that that hurdle now. Yep. Yes, actually, we have developed uh, processes to uh, help issuers and banks to to come on board uh, and, and make this process simpler um, and more straightforward. So having gained the experience with the key opinion leaders um, and and others. Uh, we we actually have developed um, yeah this this process is quite quite well now. Now another issue which businesses like yours face is whether to work with the incumbents or work against them. It's always tempting to think, well, the market needs transformation. Let's go from where we are now to a glorious future in one bound. That's a very difficult thing to pull off. You have made a virtue of working with the existing intermediaries is my explanation sufficient to explain why you've done that or does it make sense for for reasons other than you can't change the world overnight well we we didn't want to uh, change the process because uh, as you say changing the process upside down you've seen this a lot in the blockchain world the dlt yes. uh, where uh, a lot of trainings. yes in that area uh, yeah. a, a lot of very intelligent people just said let's bring issue and investors together uh, and that should work but the market has developed for a reason uh, over the past 100 150 years uh, in in such a way there's regulation which you cannot ignore um, there is uh, market customs and habits uh, which you cannot ignore and you cannot uh, have, there's this experiment if you ask um, anyone in an organization uh, anyone wants change everybody will say yes uh, but then if you ask uh, who actually wants to change uh, themselves then uh, their hands will will stay down uh, because uh, we, we all used to to what we used to um, and also we look before we really started we did a lot of academic research uh, there's a lot of papers for example from the fed uh, that intermediated markets are more efficient uh, than disintermediated markets um, and it, it it makes sense because if you're a big issue you have potentially thousand uh, or more investors like now the EU or ESM or KFW or, 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 or the likes, uh, you would need to build a, a huge investor relations department to deal with all these investors, keep them updated and so on. So this is really where the banks can play their, their strengths. But what we want to provide is that they can focus on their strengths and not uh, lose their time in 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 the boring but important part, which is process uh, and um, um and and back office and and, and other stuff so uh, i think what we can provide is is more focus uh, for each participant on on their strengths dominic uh, let me add an element of uh, speed and 
uh, scalability to what Robert just has said. If we want to set a new standard and if we want to improve the funding market fast, however, without jeopardizing its current liquidity, we better work with the existing intermediaries. We better support today's guys that support the primary market just now rather than working against them. And Dominic, we are convinced that we can convince them as well. Well, well, let's talk about how you convince them that the, the services that you're you're offering to them. Because the debt markets have are not short of intermediaries. You've also got the investment banks, you've got broker dealers, you've got paying agents, you've got uh, securities depositories, you've ultimately got custodian and sub custodian banks as well. So, who what is now CM offering all these intermediaries? What's good about what you're offering for them? Well, as I said before. Um... We, we have two principles, which are the issue and the investor. Uh, so these, these are the, the main uh, parties and everybody else in there is, interme is an intermediary uh, in the value chain to a higher or lesser degree in terms of, of uh, uh, contribution. Uh, the most important ones being the banks in, in bringing them together. Uh, and as I said before, what we think we can provide them is, is focus on their strengths. Uh, and not lose time on um, uh, yeah, mundane tasks that, that can be automated um, and bring them all together and, and, and make this faster. But uh, Jochen, uh, I'm sure you can add to this. Yeah. Kind of, Dominic, if we bring all those intermediaries that do their bits and pieces, if we bring them all in one environment, one open environment, of course, we are solving the coordination problem and we are cutting lead and lag times. And this is, let's say, why it works. And this is also where we uh, start convincing them because uh, they get better in what they do if they, let's say, are using our platform. Mm -hmm. And as we said, we, we're growing the pie. Um, so everybody yeah. benefits from, from this. Yeah. Think of the data that is machine readable. Today's data probably is not machine readable. It's, uh, let's say, a collection of uh, PDFs. And this is, let's say, where the difference really kicks in. Machine readable digital data for everyone along the value chain. This makes the process faster and more efficient. And that's what you mean, Jochen, by this term you used earlier, the golden source. Yes. Data. Yes, you don't need the duplication. You take it from the golden source, you use it for whatever you are supposed to do, and everybody else, let's say, can see this. It's transparent. And that uh, is the, the new, let's say, the new thing. Yeah, the, I would argue this is the new paradigm. This is where the new standard is emerging. We actually, internally, we're not thinking in documents anymore. Um, we see the documents as a man one manifestation of many uh, of the data that we uh, collect and 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 enhance. Uh, so, if of course at the moment regulation requires um, these documents, maybe in the future we can get rid of them because if everything is machine readable and the computers can speak to each other. Um, but at the moment it's a requirement, so we collect the data and it and we send it to the documents and it manifests there. Um, but we can also send it to other systems, to a treasury system, to, as I said, Swift or anywhere else. So this this is really the, the change is that it's not captured anymore in unstructured PDFs or Word documents. Yes, I think anybody listening to this conversation won't miss that point that this is about a transition from talking about documentation to talking about data, because data is what computers eat and exchange yeah. and process more efficiently than than human beings through paper and email and so on so yeah it's a it's a, a glimpse of the future in a way now R robert mentioned uh the two principles here the issuers and the um the investors and we've talked a bit about um your dialogues with potential issuers does it also make sense for you to be looking to recruit investors directly or do you prefer to leave that side of things to the intermediaries that you're working with? So the feedback we get from 
from the banks and from the issue from the issues mostly actually is that they prefer to have the banks on board because they do a valuable job they do a good job um and they prefer to to do so i think Jochen in the marketplace in in ucp we have a few investors connected directly with which is kind of the exception to the rule uh but most of the trades are done uh, anyway by the banks yeah, yeah. Uh, let me expand here indeed we have investors directly connected to our marketplace as members. However, let's say our experience shows our data shows that nevertheless, let's say 99% of the deals are intermediated, nevertheless. So let's say even the investors directly connected to NAUCM France marketplace prefer the additional liquidity and service provided by the dealer banks. and. Uh, Therefore, let's say we rather think growing the pie by bringing more issuers and more dealers to the market will actually help. This does not preclude some direct trades between issuers and investors, but this is certainly, let's say, not the main meat. Let's say the main meat is, uh, let's say, intermediate transactions to the benefit of uh, both parties involved. I guess, Jochen, part of your thinking here is that liquidity is a chronic problem in the certainly the corporate bond markets if not the government bond markets and so yep. you need those dealer banks to yep. create it artificially so i can see why investors take the view they do and um uh, why you take the view you do uh, what we can do with investors on on the other hand and we have the cooperation with uh, liquid net where we are connected actually to investors is we can provide them data which makes the mm. work of the banks also easier uh, because nowadays investors complain that they get the prospectus just two hours before the book opens and don't have really time uh, to look at it and, and so on. Uh, with our real-time um, documentation engine uh, and the connection uh, via LiquidNet, we can provide all the information in a machine-readable format uh, right into the EMS or OMS uh, of the relevant investor. Uh, which which makes their life easier and and the interaction with the banks as well. So uh, again, here the the, the data uh, plays a, a huge role. Uh, and uh, Dominic, maybe let me add one more thought here. And as part of let's say uh, promoting the European Capital Markets Union, let's say there will be a single access point for investor information. And we are, of course, happy to contribute to this, uh, let's say, information to be gathered there with our data model and with, let's say, our machine readable data. This is, let's say, the way to go to, how would you say, to enable investors to do more, not necessarily, let's say, to uh, disintermediate uh, the dealer banks. You're talking there of a single European consolidated take yes. plus, right? Yeah, and uh, the access point for investors. Mm -hmm. The consolidated tape is uh, then a second step. And of course, let's say the earlier you get the primary market information, i.e. the execution of an issuance on the tape, the better the tape gets, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see you better um, go and see your friend Christine Lagarde to talk about what you're doing. I think you'll have a supporter there. Uh, we've talked about data a lot, uh, which brings me to the subject of, of green bonds, which are, have been identified not just by you, but by others as a, as a potential opportunity here. Is data the strength you, you bring to the green bond market, by which I mean avoiding greenwashing primarily? Um, there is a data aspect to this, but um, this, this was more of a... Um let's say fine by the market uh, the we, we're providing the tools and uh the, the, now the very intelligent people in the market are seeing these tools uh, that we provide and and finding more use cases than we ever thought of uh, which is which is great and one of these was dark green bonds so at the moment you have uh green bonds they are never binding 
uh, the use of proceeds clause is always we intend to do and then you have a green framework uh, which is 80 pages this is written by lawyers uh, and and has uh, 700 escape clauses uh, so I, I read recently one of a large car manufacturer it says they have two years to invest the proceeds into green things so they could theoretically take the proceeds of a green bond uh develop more diesel um and then after two years put it into um uh, into some green stuff so the reason why issues don't do that and in contrary to the loan market where they actually have binding covenants is that uh, <clears throat> if you put the binding covenants especially use of proceeds into the bond anyone can buy a bond and then can start suing you uh, so we would see probably a lot of frivolous lawsuits where activist investors, hedge funds or whatever, go to New York, sue you because you haven't 100% complied with your green covenant. Um, and then in the worst case of all, trigger even a cross default. Um, and it's understandable that the market uh, didn't want to go this way because there was no solution uh, available over the past uh, 20 years or so since green bonds came up. But with our issuance vehicle, we found that actually we can enhance the way green bonds are issued by protecting the issuer. So we would include the, the green covenants just in the loan between our vehicle and the underlying uh, borrower. Uh, and the bond uh, would be issued without green covenants, but investors would know that the bond is linked to the underlying loan and given how Luxembourg securitization law, which is applicable there works, uh, we would be basically a trustee uh, and we would have a predefined way of dealing with um, infringements of the covenants. So uh, you would have binding covenants, which means uh, an, uh, a third party reviewer would have very clear criteria whether this is fulfilled or not. If it's not fulfilled, then uh, we have an automatic process that gives you a certain grace period to repair it. Uh, if that doesn't help, then there is an interest step up or a penalty with a shorter uh, grace period. And if all of this doesn't help, uh, then the underlying borrower is knowingly, willingly going the, the way to not comply with the covenants. He has the obligation to pay back uh, the bond at, at 100% which protects investors because in other cases where green bonds became brown, um, they had to fire sale the bonds um, uh, at, at a very low price because obviously no one wants to buy a green bond that is not green anymore um, and, and, and didn't have any uh, additional uh, protection. But with, with our structure, we, we can uh, now solve this uh, because we have this regulated uh, environment and, and the law playing uh, here, the, making us a kind of a trustee uh, for this uh, intermediate um, solution where activist investors also cannot sue you for uh, the covenants directly uh, because they're a step removed, but still binding. So also the, uh, let's say the... Um, um, surveillance tasks that an investor has towards his investments uh, are much easier and, and much lower than at the moment where you need to see does it fit into the green framework we actually green frameworks would fall away with this um, uh, with this solution because you have a clear covenant I'm going to invest this money into this project or into this um, change of my my electricity grid or whatever it is and uh, there is also a political dimension to this, Dominic. Uh, this, uh, let's say, dark green bonds via now treasury that Robert has just, let's say, explained. We also made a presentation of this to the Capital Markets Working Group of the Sustainability Finance Beirat of the German government. And we are also talking, let's say, with French initiatives, government initiatives that is that go that way. Mm -hmm. So you're you're building yourselves into the political momentum behind sustainable financing as well. Yeah, we could contribute to resolve the problem. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a, uh, a a while back, Robert, very forcefully that you're determined to be a regulated institutional grade 
uh, organization. Uh, and I, I promised to come back to, to the regulatory issue. Can you explain in more detail what regulatory licenses now CM actually possesses and, and what those allow the company to do or not do? Yes, with pleasure. So I'll speak about Luxembourg and Jochen can then speak in detail about France. But in Luxembourg, we are uh, regulated as a securitization vehicle. It's a bit of an unfortunate name because it doesn't really have to do uh, anything with securitization. It's actually uh, a deposit taking license under CRD uh, 3, uh, which is a national uh, option for each country and Luxembourg has implemented this. So it, it's basically a banking license light where you can uh, take deposits, but uh, allows uh, to issue also uh, bonds in lower denomination, which which is uh similar to deposit taking and uh, we we aim to do this because we always thought that uh, for trust building um and to work with all these counterparties that we have uh with, with these huge institutions we need to have uh discover which uh, implies uh, for us a, a, a lot of cost and additional work uh but we we are convinced that this is uh Worth it. So in, in Luxembourg, we are allowed to to issue bonds also to to retail and general uh, public, which we rarely do, but uh, that the license uh, covers for this. And it also means that we need to um, uh, report our transactions to the central bank. We need to report our transactions to the regulator. Uh, all our uh, directors and management uh, and shareholders are checked on fit and proper. Uh, so we don't have any uh, oligarchs that are sanctioned or, or anything in, in our uh, shareholding because this is all checked uh, very, very detailed by uh, the regulator in Luxembourg. Um, our, uh, let's say, software environment is, is not regulated because there's, there's not really regulation for it. It's indirectly regulated via uh, the outsourcing rules of the banks uh, but we have of course an, an iso uh, certification for our software uh, that is some kind of let's say voluntary regulation uh, in which we um, are, are very um, yeah uh, keen to to maintain and 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 to keep because it's it's also a quality seal uh, the heaviest part of regulation is is in France with the MTF. Yes, indeed. Yeah, now CM France has a <clears> license <throat> as an investment firm and multilateral trading facility by ACPR by the Banque de France Banking Supervision and also by the AMF, the Autorité des Marchés Financiers. And of course, what Robert has explained about the board of directors uh, and the shareholders also applies to, let's say, now CM France. And uh, of course, uh, let's say this uh, makes us a multiple trading facility, a multilateral trading facility that can, let's say, safely execute trades. And we are also doing the reporting, let's say, to Banque de France and also to ESMA. So issuers, investors and dealers can be sure that this is, let's say, a safe and well-monitored environment. Are these three licenses you've got, the banking license in Luxembourg, the investment services license in France, and the trading license in France, these are passportable, it enables you to, to provide services throughout the EU, does it? Do they? Uh, the France, uh, the French one, yes. Uh, the Luxembourg one, as, as I said, is a national option, is, is not passportable. Uh, but it's not necessary because uh, everything happens in Luxembourg, so there's, there's no need to... Uh, to, to passport it. Mm -hmm. And you don't envisage needing a banking license on a pan-European scale anytime soon? No, I think this is exactly what we're uh, trying to, to, to avoid because uh, banks do much more business than we do. So we, we want to have these focused licenses um, <clears throat> that cover our business. Um, we're not providing loans. We're not... Uh, uh writing derivatives or anything so this this would go far uh too far if you want to remain a neutral marketplace yeah we cannot put uh let's say transactions on our balance sheet 
technologies. It's been a while since I uh, had a conversation like this where we didn't talk about blockchain much earlier. Uh, mm. Can you tell us a bit about the, the technologies that you're using? You mentioned cloud, obviously. Uh, what else are you using? Why did you choose those technologies over others? Well, what we wanted to create is uh, an accessible platform for everyone that is uh, scalable and can be shared easily. Uh, so we spoke about the principles and the intermediaries in between. Um, so it, how we build our platform is uh, that these intermediaries, they don't need to be our clients uh, because otherwise we would need to onboard everyone first uh, before we can do any, uh, any transactions. Uh, so we devised a system that uh, even if they're not our clients, they can participate in transactions. Obviously, if you're a client directly, you have much more benefits and uh, you, you can um, use the platform in a more comprehensive way. Uh, but uh, I think this is one of the key features um, and, and that's why we're using cloud uh, providers and the cloud platform. Uh, we looked into DLT, uh, but again, we had the, the, the same problem if we would uh, base ourselves completely on DLT. Uh, theoretically, it would probably be the best solution, uh, but practically you would need to onboard everybody first uh, on, on, this, on this blockchain. Um, and we're not uh, big enough, nor do we have uh, the, the market power to decide which blockchain is now the right one to use or which interoperability provider. Uh, so we, we leave this completely to the market to decide. Um, what we do is we are blockchain ready in the sense that all our data is machine readable. And if you look at the blockchain bonds that have been issued so far, they, they're relatively simple smart contracts, so they're not, not so smart <laughs> contracts. Um, because the, the data wasn't available until now, so for the life cycle of the bond. So we have now all this data available and we can inject this either into a DLT uh, or into a treasury system. It, it doesn't really matter. We, it's, it's all in a machine readable, easily translatable uh, way so that you can really make really smart contracts that cover the entire life cycle of a, of a bond and any actions there uh, afterwards. In, in terms of AI, we've been experimenting with it. We, we're using it internally, of course, for, for development and, and uh, other use cases that are well known. Uh, but we try to look whether we can use it for our data model. And we found uh, that this is rather complicated because in the end, AI are statistical models. Uh, you can find, by the way, very interesting uh, research on that also by AQR, uh, the fund. Um, and for finance, you cannot rely on statistics because the bond needs to be 100% correct. And if, if, if you know lawyers uh, like myself in the past and my colleagues, uh, we will go berserk if there is a, a comma not in the right place or if there's a paragraph. And not because we are so pedantic, but because it can change the, the, the meaning of a sentence. So um, this is why we really spend so much time developing our data model that it can replicate all this information in a, in a correct way. Um, because if you start issuing a bond that is 90% correct, uh, I think no, no issue, no bank would like to take the liability for the 10% that might not be correct. And um, the, the models, the data models at the moment, at least, are not yet there to uh, provide uh, full reliance. It, it really needs to be a structured data model like we have and, and Jochen uh, implemented uh, for, for Europe, like in ISO 20022 or, or in ISTA FPML. These, these are all data models that are fully structured and don't rely on, on AI. But we, we see in the future, for example, in the marketplace, AI could play a role to find patterns that are, are not visible on the first place or, or other things. Uh, Jochen, I think you yeah. can... can uh... Yeah, I have, uh, let's say, one, uh, one extra piece of information for Dominic, because uh, Dominic had mentioned uh, earlier the uh, ID2S CSD that was, let's say, fully working on the blockchain. And uh, 
when now CM France was still, let's say, named now CP, this uh, custody service of ID2S unfortunately had to be decommissioned because uh, the investors did not find it sufficiently attractive to split their assets under custody between, let's say, ID2S on chain and the other CSDs they were using. And of course, you can argue that also the competitive pressure by existing CSDs played a role to make ID2S not commercially viable. So let's say ID2S was decommissioned before, let's say, now CM uh, took over now CP France and before, let's say, we, let's say, repositioned the company as a marketplace working together, let's say, with existing CSDs. That certainly accords with our understanding of what happens at uh, what happened at ID2S, which we wrote about shortly after it it all happened. Tokenization, uh, what part does this play in your thinking? And, and I ask this because if I look at the list of security token issues which we maintain here at uh, at Future of Finance, I find the bond markets feature quite heavily, uh, less in terms of of issuances, though there are some of those. Uh, much more in terms of proofs of concept, uh, pilot tests, partnerships, acquisitions, announcements, and so on. You know, there is a kind of focus, uh, some of it on the primary market segment, which which you are you are focused on. But certainly, people see the bond markets as a more immediate opportunity for tokenization than, say, the the equity markets. So, does tokenization form any part of your strategy or thinking now, or do you think it might in the future? Well, uh, I, I think tokenization is is here to stay and will play a, a part in in the economy. So, as as we said before, as and as you mentioned, these proof of concepts are that proof of concepts. Uh, we'll we'll need to see the implementation in a broader uh, marketplace, um, and um, this means that um, again, these these smart contracts uh, will need to be become smart uh, so that uh, the data comes in but as my co-founder fred kreutz also always says we're heading to a digital economy so we see tokenization also taking place in other parts uh, for example you build a wind farm each windmill will have will, might be represented by a token and this token might uh, feed data into the capital markets about production about wind uh, about uh, repair cycles about uh, what whatever this windmill does and this is actually real-time credit information um, so we will get this real-time credit information from uh, from issuers from uh, from from projects or, or wherever it comes from uh, and this needs to be then uh, integrated into the contract so for example if you have a, a project finance uh, going on and the wind farms are linked to the production and you need to put more money into the reserve account if the production of, of the wind farm is not as much as as it is, all of this can be automated because then suddenly you have the the credit information and you have the tools that we provide, which is the automated uh, data model that that can uh, reflect the life cycle of um, um, of, of of the instrument, um, and therefore marrying these two, uh, we see huge potential for for the future. The other thing is, as Jochen mentioned before, algo trading. Uh, you, you have huge uh, market makers in the equity space because equity is a share, it's a perpetual instrument, maybe you have two or three, uh, but that's it. Bonds, you have myriads of different uh, types. Uh, large companies have, have many diff dozens of bonds outstanding and information about those bonds uh, has been very scarce. So... Uh, again, there, there could be algo trainings or smart contracts on the buy side. Um, in, in the end, it's the same. It's programmable, programmable uh, automated uh, trading, um, which uh, needs more information and which we can now bring to the market. And as Jochen said before, to also to the secondary markets. It all comes back to data, doesn't it? In so the end, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's surprising how often we've ended up there. 
I described NRCM as a as a market infrastructure in my opening remarks. You yourselves have described NRCM as a as a new era market infrastructure. I just wonder if that new era you're referring to looks forward to a single European capital market. Uh, Jochen, you've touched upon the the CMU a number of times in this in this conversation. It is now CM the market infrastructure for the debt side of a single European capital market? Yes, uh, it could be the infrastructure for the debt side of the capital markets because we can overcome the market fragmentations and the frictions that are holding back the evolution of the capital markets union. And this is to the detriment of the European issuers, of the European dealers and the investors alike. And of course, this is to the detriment of the economy at large. I mentioned earlier the virtual cycle of primary debt markets and how this will add strength to the CMU. And this is where we see ourselves being, let's say, the accelerator. We are the nucleus. We are the accelerator of this. And the new standard will help here, and we are part of this. And this is also why we are, let's say, wildly determined to work with the current ecosystem and the current players. That's the only way to get this moving fast enough. And uh, let's say improving EU competitiveness and boosting the financing of the, let's say, economy at large of SMEs and more particular of the transformation towards a digital and a more sustainable economy. This is worthwhile and this is, let's say, something, let's say, we absolutely want to support and uh, this is where we can help. So a switch from bank financing to capital markets finance yep. in Europe yep. would be good for the investment banking side of the the commercial and investment banks not so good for the commercial banking side ah, i would argue this goes hand in hand because mm -hmm. if you look at commercial banks how they structure their loan books today i guess we could work with them together usually an issuer would let's say show up at uh, the door of now cm with his banker hand in hand almost yeah mm -hmm. so it's usually a kind of a joint decision making here and that's uh, why we think it's, uh, let's say, rather adding value than, let's say, just shifting uh, market share between the loan book and uh, the funding market. And I guess there are capital savings for the banks too, are there not? Yes, they are. They are. And uh, therefore, I think this uh, is a continuum. You, you do loans, you do bonds, you do kind of German Schulzschein in between, yeah? You have to play the full scale. And uh, this is also why bankers are working with us. Right, interesting. Uh, growing the business uh, in, in the future, you mentioned uh, your relationship earlier, Robert, with, with bond auction. You also have a partnership with, with Market Node in Singapore. Uh, what are these relationships bringing to your, your growth strategy? Well, <clears throat> as, as I said, we are an open ecosystem. So what we're trying to build, and, and, and these two are prime examples, uh, is uh, additional benefits for users of the platform. So we are not specialists in, in auctions, uh, So, but bond auction, uh, they are. Um, and they can sit on top of, of, of our uh, ecosystem and of, of our operating system, if you want to call it like that. Um, and if an issue wants to thinks he has enough market power to actually command an auction, they can just sign up, send the data with a push of a button to bond auction. They do the auction, they send the data back to us with the pricing, and we finalize all the legal documentation. Uh, so it's it's really adding capabilities uh, and and benefiting others uh, mutually um, to to. Uh, work in a in an open ecosystem where you can, uh, like as I said in the in in, in uh, before, you can push the share button on your phone and and share a document to a myriad different apps. Um, the same you can do with our data with with a push of a button. And Market Note, uh, the same thing in in Asia, um, where we uh, work with them um, in uh, in in a various ways together so one is providing uh, data services uh, they have a fantastic tool on on green bonds a, a database 
Uh, they have another fantastic tool on uh, a database on covenants uh, of bonds. Uh, so all of this can be integrated um, and and um, uh, provide additional benefits and services to to users of the platform. And the fact you're working with with market node in Singapore indicates your ambitions are not certainly not limited to to Europe. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a bit more about how you see international growth uh, going forward. But also, one I suppose uh, theme which has been very clear in this in this conversation is that debt is your is your primary focus. I just wonder if you're thinking that you might stray into other asset classes as well. So there's sort of two headed question there are your ambitions limited to europe and are your ambitions limited to debt okay uh dominic uh, let me grapple with the geographic dimension first and uh, certainly our ambitions are not limited to europe we are also developing services for the us market and for asia and of course our partnership with market note is a case in point and uh, of course let's say this uh, improving and digitalizing primary markets, the debt markets, that is, this is not confined by currency or geography. The data model works its magic across the board. And of course, let's say, if you take this, comp uh, this comprehensive advantage of the data model, you could also extend this into the loan market, say. Loans are very close to bonds. The data model is similar. So we would, let's say, also be able to support the growth of loan markets. With equity, this is more difficult. Equity in by, let's say, by definition is not issued so often. So let's say the virtue of the data model will work, let's say, on lesser opportunities. So we find, let's say, bonds and perhaps in the future also the loan market more attractive. For equity, we can probably not do so much. And other asset classes, if you think of the crypto space, we discussed this earlier. We can support, of course, tokens. We can, let's say, populate tokens with uh, the information required. That's also something we are certainly looking at. And and one additional area which, which uh, I forgot uh, is derivatives. So there's a lot of uh, I mean, a lot of bonds are issued alongside a derivative, swap, and yeah. uh, we already cover, for example, swap term sheets with uh, cross currency or interest rate swaps. Um, so from from there to really uh, filling out then uh, the the data into the swap documentation um, is is a very short step as well. Mm -hmm. Are we working there also with others that are already further down the road, uh, like Link Latest with, with their derivatives platform? They, they've done a great job there uh, as well. Right. But this again shows the open ecosystem and again how data can flow. Uh, and and um, there's a, <clears throat> there, I think there was a study. Uh, by one investment bank, this, uh, which uh, I'm not sure if 100% uh, put it rightly, but uh, when they issue a bond, they have to type it in manually into 27 uh, systems, uh, which, which is not surprising. Um, and and this manual input can, can of course, uh, stop with this uh, API database with API connection um, that we offer. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. You're you're incorporating currency and interest rate swaps into your into your model as well. Was going to be a big driver of of debt issues. This is my final question. Uh, I promise it's my last one. And we touched upon it earlier when we talked about a, a number of startups which have addressed the the primary capital markets uh, and the lack of secondary market liquidity as well. Not an area of interest to you, but some looked at that. So this area has been identified as an area ripe for reform by uh, entrepreneurs before you and a number of startups some of which we have we have entertained at, at, at future of finance not all of which are still with us i might say so a lot of time and effort has been invested in this in this area to achieve reform but success has proved pretty elusive 
you've obviously got some traction you've you've got issues you've got got investors engaged you've got the intermediaries engaged what what makes you as the management of now cm confident that you can succeed where these other startups have struggled to achieve a breakthrough well i think what differentiates us is that we uh, and and that's maybe down uh, to to where we started which was an industry initiative in in frankfurt we have a little bit of the german mindset where we build a product that really works well and then go out we we don't uh, uh, go out with with half baked stuff and, and make a lot of marketing uh, which some also told us is, is actually a weak point of us. A lot of people didn't even know us for until uh, some time ago. Um, but we, we really put a lot of effort in and, and thought and, and also academic rigor uh, to, to develop a business model that is not only attractive for investors, but also supports the market. Um, and that's why we... we are regulated that's why we have this data model that took 10 years plus to to develop uh, and many other things and as i said we see now the benefits of of this hard work um by having won uh, all competitive rfps where where we participated and i think this this gives us uh, the 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 benefit of uh, uh, of of this work that we've done um I think also what we need to see here is also, as we mentioned before, it, this is a, a place where one platform or, or mostly a maximum two will, will take the brunt uh, of the market because uh, the principals just don't have the time to check which platform is the one that suits them best and uh, which can do what what they want. So, I think being the more, the platform with the broadest uh, basis, being vertically integrated, and also being the only one that is based in Europe, um, I think uh, that, that this helps a lot in the decision making for the key opinion leaders. Uh, let me add uh, two flavors here, if I may, Robert. One flavor is openness. We are an open platform. We are not a closed environment. Therefore, I think uh, this willingness to share, to support, and to work with others is also something that, let's say, helps us in having success. And the other flavor is regulation, or you put it, Robert, regulatory great company. Yeah. Let's say we are, let's say, we are reliable in this respect. And I think this is also one factor that is, let's say, arguing in our favor. That's a great place to stop. Uh, a combination of German thoroughness and Anglo-Saxon <laughs> openness is going to lead you to be the, the winner in this race to transform the primary debt capital markets uh, in Europe. Robert Koller and Jochen Metzger, thank you very much for taking so much time to share your knowledge and your experience and your insights with the members of Future, Future of Finance. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was. Thank you, Dominic.